The third Sunday after the Epiphany, Almighty and everlasting God mercifully look upon our infirmities and in all our dangers and necessities stretch forth thy right hand to help and defend us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we turn to verse 5 of Epiphany, hymn 116. No more, no more will count ourselves our own, but his in bonds love. Oh, may such bonds forever draw our souls to things above. Well, we now turn our attention to the life and times of Robert Gross Testa. I'm not sure how they said. I've never heard it ever said in school. Read his name here and there through the years and uh, understand he had his issues with the Pelagians and was a double predestinarian, but we'll see in Augustinian by George Perry, prebendary of Lincoln and proctor of the Diocese of Lincoln, published by the Society for Promoting Christian Knowledge, 1871. On Whitefriars Street. <laughs> Preface. Let's see the sources of letters. The life of Bishop taken from volume A. Latin letters edited by Lord. Valuable sketch of the Bishop's life. The chronicles are annals of the monasteries of Burton Dunstable. Lannercost and others, a volume of Monumenta Franciscana, see a Franciscan. The Greater History of Matthew Paris, the Monk of St. Albans. From this latter, as will be seen, the chief part of the incidents of Gross Test's life are taken. The famous abbey at St. Albans produced many historical writers of whom Matthew, oh yeah, we forgot to look this guy up. He, uh, he preceded um, Matthew Paris, is my understanding, and Tom, Thomas Wilson, and are perhaps the most renowned. Matthew Paris also wrote another historical work called The Lesser History, and the greater part of the chronicle called History of Matthew of Westminster, the other part having been composed by a Westminster monk named John Bevere. None of the Middle Age writers of our history is more interesting and, for the most part, more trustworthy and fair than Matthew Paris. But it must be remembered that, as one of a body to whom Gross Test was especially severe, he is inclined to bear rather hardly upon the bishop. On the other hand, the bishop's opposition to Rome called forth his warm admiration for Matthew Paris wrote in a thoroughly national spirit. The following life does not contain all that might be said of Bishop Grosteste. I'm just going to say Grosteste, Grosteste. I'll just say Grosteste. I've, maybe there's a French way of saying it or an English way that I'm not getting, but henceforth Grosteste was chiefly confined to his work as a great reformer in the corrupt period of the church and to his quarrel with the Pope. <laughs> That's what I had generally heard. The Life and Times of Robert Grosteste, Bishop of Lincoln, Chapter 1. The interest which attaches to Bishop Grosteste's life and as a great church reformer, as the most learned man of his day, is taking a prominent part in the critical period of public affairs his life illustrative of the state of the church of that period. And that's that's the angle I'm interested in. Besides the man himself, I'm interested in the social, the economic, literary, and, and more so the theological stuff. Again, Old Testament, New Testament, systematic theology. Church history, which we're doing here, and then practical and contemporary theology. How do I tell Charles and Susan across the street about this Bishop of Lincoln? Why would they be interested in that if 
at all. The monasteries, the privileged orders, the parochial clergy, the chapter of Lincoln, and gross tests not exempt from failings, but a noble and devoted character. The life of Robert Grosseteste, the most famous bishop of the medieval church of England, must needs interest all who glory in connecting themselves with the old traditions of their country and love to think of their church not as a new sect sprung up in modern days, but as the lineal successors of the ancient church of that land. Robert Grosseteste was the Protestant of the 13th century. This is going to be fun but he was a Protestant upon the highest church principles and from the conviction which forced upon him that the papal system and its practical working was anti-Christian <laughs> and destructive of souls. No man ever had more intense faith in the divine mission of the church. No man ever had higher claims for church authority. No man was willing to concede more complete ascendancy to him who claimed to be the vicar of Christ on earth. But the evil use made by the Pope of his preeminence revolted him, <coughs> and stirred his soul to utter those indignant protests with which his life concludes. The most ardent supporter of Rome of his day, he died, if not excommunicated, yet cursed and reviled by the Pope. This was because he loved the truth and right, because his soul revolted from corruption and deceit, because it refused to be contaminated even at the command of him whom all his have education and habits of thought had taught him to regard as the representative upon earth. Here was a man whose zeal for holiness was the constraining influence of his life, a zeal not always according to knowledge. I'm trying to record. Hey. What? I'm trying to record. Sorry. Uh, excuse me. A little family dispute with my grandson. I'm getting ready to go to Detroit tomorrow. I'm getting all a zeal not always according to knowledge but always genuine and unpolluted. He lived in a corrupt age and he aspired to be the great reformer of the church of his day as his friend Simon de Montfort was of state. He contended with monster abuses of all sorts, but he never ceased to combat bravely for the right with corrupted monasteries, with the ignorant and negligent clergy with the unjust and encroaching king, with the Pope basely selling his edicts for gold. He fought an unshrinking battle, and he did not fight in vain. The remembrance of his bold and earnest life animated many in after times who were called to the same struggles and may animate many yet to faithful labors for the truth. Besides being the most ardent practical reformer, Robert Grosseteste was also the most learned man of his time, not only in England, but all Europe, and one of the most voluminous writers that England has produced. He was the greatest theologian, the greatest natural philosopher, the greatest master of language of his day. His works, which are almost still unprinted, are more than 200 in number are upon almost every subject of theology and science. He wrote a religious poem in French called The Castle of Love and is supposed to have written some other poems which are lost. He enjoyed the greatest reputation for learning of any man in his day and preserved it all through the Middle Ages. For a writer to be able to quote Lincoln Niensis on his side was almost conclusive. John Wycliffe in his const controversies constantly refers to him. The good Bishop Hall rejoiced to be able to find a support for his scriptural views in this famous divine. And if the interest which belongs to Robert Grosseteste personally is so great, that which belongs to, to the era in which he lived is no less. 
His light commences from the beginning of the reign of John and extends nearly up to the War of the Barons. It thus includes almost the whole period of the great struggle in this country for nationality in church and state. And there's a couple of footnotes here. The works of Bishop Grostesque, which are printed, are a treatise on the ceasing of the law, extracts from his sermons and lectures published by Mr. Brown in 1690, a collection of short scientific treatises published in the 16th century, and finally the valuable collection of his letters lately published by Mr. Luard. And then it refers to Lewis's life of Wycliffe. I've not read that. The cause in church and state was essentially the same. To both, the great and pressing danger was encroachment of aliens. John had basely consented to hold his kingdom as a fief of the Pope, and the Popes had not been slow to exercise the seniorial rights which they acquired, basically making England a fiefdom of the Pope. Pandolf, the Pope's representative, had attempted to govern England as a despotic governor in a subject province. The great minister, Hubert de Burgh, and the noble primate, Stephen Langton, had jointly contended against and last overthrown him. The popes had treated the English church as that which they had a right to spoil and dispose of at their own will. The barons, the commons, the lower clergy, and at length the rulers of the state responded to their exactions by a resistance more or less vigorous, which in the end triumphed in the energetic hands of Edward I. During the long reign of Henry III, the feebleness and vacillation of the king, his affection for foreigners, he married a Spanish girl, Spanish uh, royal, his pressing need for money and hence his inducement to court the Pope made the struggle for national independence difficult and fluctuating. The authority of one legate was overthrown, but Henry soon welcomed another to shield his weakness and to minister to his necessities. Archbishop Stephen Langton had put a stop to the papal provisions which granted to foreigners benefices in English, English church. But in the times of Archbishop Edmund Rich, this abuse became more flagrant than before. To churchmen, the Pope seemed to have a claim on their dutiful obedience as head of the church on earth. He was able to protect them from the king's exactions and from what appeared to them the most terrible of grievances, the subjection to the civil power. Hence, in spite of many scandals and much injustice, churchmen were inclined to cling to the Pope and to choose his side before that of the nation. There were some indeed who took effectually the popular side, but generally the more influential clergy were for the legates and the Pope, while the feeling of the nationality and the desire for independence were stronger among the lower clergy and in the monasteries. Among those who first ranged themselves distinctly on the papal side and foreign and against the popular and national side, Robert Grosteste occupies a conspicuous position. He was a churchman of the highest hierarchical notions. Beckett himself did not assert the immunities and privileges of the church with greater intrepidity. He was ready at all times to use his influence against the king when he endeavored to encroach upon or tax the church. He welcomed the legate Otho. At Lyon, he signed the rescript of King John's session of the kingdom to the Pope. So he was with King John. He gathered taxes for the Pope. He argued for the Pope's right to dispose of all benefices benefices. He declined to join the archbishop in opposing the provisions. Yet, he ended by denouncing the Pope's action in this matter as in the highest degree iniquitous. 
and by appealing to the people of England to take their stand on the nationality of their church, to arrange the temporal power in its defense. The life of Grosteste is therefore illustrative of the great struggle of his day and of his century. He commenced by boldly advocating the views to which, by his antecedents and surroundings, he was altogether inclined. But the stern force of truth and right compelled him at last to abandon them. He commenced by welcoming the legate, the wielder of an irresponsible power. He ended by excommunicating the breakers of Magna Carta and had his life been prolonged, would probably have energetically sided with the barons. Even more illustrative than the public policy is the life of Grosteste of the internal state of the church in his time. At first of the state of the monasteries, the writers of the 12th century speak in the most bitter and melancholy tones of the demoralized state of the religious houses. They were pledged to follow the strict and searching rule of St. Benedict, and in almost all cases, they utterly neglected it. If we may believe Walter Mapes, Archdeacon of Oxford in the 12th century, the monks were for the most part given over to immorality. St. Bernard, the most holy man of his day and himself a monk, says that he is struck with amazing at the excesses in eating and drinking, in clothing, in bed furniture, in equipages to be seen everywhere everywhere in the monasteries. No one cares, he says, for that bread which is from heaven. No attention is paid to scriptures or to the salvation of souls. Jokes and merriment are all the care. During the feast, as much as the jaws are occupied with eating, so are the ears with idle talk. Dishes are heaped upon dishes, and so great is the art of the cook that you may devour four or five and not be satisfied. That's where Thomas Cranmer talks about those who are serving the belly gods or, or carefully sought for and consumed to excess. The most delicate stuffs were procured for clothing. Abbots might be seen with a train of 60 horse and all sorts of luxuries carried in their train. The way prevailing in some English monasteries is clearly shown in some of the chronicles recently published. In Dunstable Priory, the whole effort of the canon seems to have been to gain possession of the seigneurial rights over the town, and sometimes by open violence, sometimes by legal quibbles, to get the advowsons of churches and the right to appropriate tithes. The monastery was bitterly hated by the townspeople. The annals of Tewkesbury Abbey disclosed the same sort of grasping and unfair tricks used to gain property and add vowsons. <coughs> the Chronicle of Evesham draws the picture of the grossest immorality prevailing in the abbey and gives us plainly to understand that it was the general custom of the monks to forge documents. All these houses, without exception, held the bishop's visitation, to which they were subject the most terrible of evils, and resorted to every device to evade it. At Coventry, the visitation was openly resisted, and the prior suspended in consequence. The abbots of St. Augustine at Canterbury, of Edmondsbury, of Westminster, were suspended on the same ground. Now, with this corrupted state of the monasteries, Bishop Grosteste resolutely set himself to grapple, and by his zeal and energy, he succeeded in producing great reforms. But he had the utmost difficulties to contend against. Not only had he to defeat the opposition and intrigues of those monasteries, which were legally subject to his inspection, but there was a great number of religious houses which were specially exempted from all visitation of the bishop by privileges granted by the Pope. The chief of these were the houses of the Cistercians or the white monks 
an order founded in the 11th century as a reform of the old Benedictines or black monks by Robert Alberic and Stephen the Englishman and to which the order the great Saint Bernard belonged. The first house of this order founded in England was the Abbey of Waverley near Farnham, founded in 1120. But it spread so rapidly that all the great monasteries built the next 150 years belonged to it. The Cistercians were at first famous for their austerity, their hard work in the fields, their severe mortifications in their houses, but they soon became very rich and luxurious. The splendid abbeys of Furness, Rivelo, Fountains, Tintern, and Vale Royal belonged to the white monks. In gross tests time, they were they needed visitation, but they were fenced off from him by the privileges given to them by the popes. So great were the privileges that the Cistercian was bound by no law, humored or divine, save his own rule. He might commit any crime. He might obstruct and paralyze ecclesiastical discipline. He might exempt large tracts from contribution burdens of the state. He might rob the parish priest of his dues, and none could inquire into his doings save the chief abbots of his order. The abuse and other similar ones attaching to the military orders, the Templars and the Hospitallers, Bishop Gross Test set himself to overcome, and at last, with infinite trouble, succeeded in great measure. Besides these great exempt orders, as they were called, there were in England in the days of Bishop Gross Test numerous cells or small establishments of foreign monks sent from some foreign missionary and dependent only on the mother establishment of discipline. These, as we shall see in the bishop's life, were the most degraded and openly immoral of the misnamed religious houses that gave him considerable trouble. Nor was the state of parochial clergy in the time of Gross Testa better than that of the monks. We have the strongest testimony that among the higher clergy, the crime of simony and taking bribes for everything was almost universal. The inquiries and directions published by the bishops of that day show us that immorality was abundantly prevalent. While Bishop Gross tests own constitutions or rules for the conduct of his clergy by the practices which they forbid, the amount of knowledge which they describe as necessary in a clergyman do not give us a high idea of the clerical state. Indeed, the bishop describes in words which will be quoted hereafter a melancholy state of degradation in the clerical life. And this, as a monster abuse, he set himself with all his energy to reform. As his chief instrument for reforming the clergy, he trusted to the great orders of the Dominican and Franciscan friars, who were then in the first fervor of their zeal and who numbered in the body some of the most noble spirits of the day. The interesting story of the first introduction of the Franciscans into England and of Gross Test's early connection with them all will be told below. The bishop lived long enough, unfortunately, to see the falling off of those whom he had known in all the excellence of their first earnestness. And on his deathbed, he condemned in solemn and severe tones the corruptions in which the friars were beginning to fall, of a corruption which eventually was more complete than even that of the monks. There is yet one other great difficulty with which Bishop Grosstes had to contend in his labors for reforming the church. This was the special privileges and immunities of the chapter of his own cathedral. In the life of St. Hugh, the famous Burgundian who built the Cathedral of Lincoln, we read that the canons of the church affected the state and pomp as they had the revenues of feudal lords. We are told that they despised Bishop Grosstest on account of his low origin. The 
Accordingly, they, allow, they refused to allow him to exercise a visitation in the cathedral or in any of the numerous churches which were affiliated with it. This, a subversive of discipline, the bishop stoutly resisted, and after a long and costly struggle in which the characters of all concerned somewhat suffered, he was successful. It will be seen then that Bishop Crosstest was an uncompromising reformer and a great beater down of ecclesiastical abuses. It will also be seen that in doing so, he often used questionable means and showed himself deficient in temper, judgment, and fairness. But though he was often wrong in the means which he employed, he never for a moment faltered in his conviction that that was the great object of his life the purifying and strengthening of the church and setting forward the salvation of souls. Every aberration which he seems to have made from the right path will be plainly stated, but the main character of this noble life will not be affected by them. From infirmities of nature, from errors of judgment, he was not exempt, but these are but trifling blemishes which do not impair the substantial beauty of this life, so full of unselfish earnestness and true Christian love. Chapter 2, Gross Test as a Scholar, 1175-1225. to 12, 25. And Now, we'll just add here that Christianity has been in England for a good thousand years. And since the advent of Augustine the Lesser at Canterbury, 600 years, I mean, it's just an enormous period of time. Place of Grosteste's birth, his name, a student at Oxford, state of Oxford in his time, the hospices, the halls, the schools, Oxford studies. Grosteste goes to Paris, is recommended as secretary to the Bishop of Hereford, Geraldus Cabrensis at Oxford, Grosteste returns thither and reaches great eminence for learning. Mention of him by Gower, by Robert de Brun, his studies of Greek, of Hebrew, the Jews in England, his French poem, his scientific works. And I think we should probably call that right there the beginning of a new chapter. And we wait with avidity to... Uh, follow up on his earnestness. Um, Epiphany hymn number 117, brightest and best of the stars of the morning, dawn on our darkness and lend us thine aid. Star of the east, the horizon adorning, guide where our infant redeemer is laid. Let us pray. Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Amen. Godspeed.